This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening, I'm Peter Cowan. And I'm Carolyn Stokes, and here's what's making news right now. He didn't know his phone number, don't know his address. They drove him off the property. Mistaken for a troublemaker, a teen is turned away by hospital security and spends the night on the streets. And it got real cold. We found a couple places to duck in. Once it was between two rocks by a car. And I consider it a real honor to put this chain over your neck to Lee Gander. After two decades as mayor, Claude Elliott calls it a day. Fred Fox returns to St. John's to talk about his brother's dream. Terry wrote in his journal, this is the day it all begins, and uh, started here in St. John's. I'll keep the umbrella sandy for yet another day. Heavy rain in the east will clear, but some lingering showers and drizzle for most, even some flurries in Labrador. The full forecast is coming up. We begin tonight with a heartwarming story of lost love. It's the story of 99-year-old Annette Vardy. Within minutes of meeting her, you realize the woman everyone calls Neat is a master storyteller. But her best story is her own. It's about a lifelong romance with a man she lost over seven decades ago. A romance you could say came full circle four days ago when Neat passed along a very special, very old gift. I place this ring on your finger. This moment, a lifelong promise made with a ring. No ordinary ring, a ring that represents a love found, then lost over 77 years ago. This is the first time Neat has performed a wedding ceremony, sealing the bond between her relative Chris Vardy and his bride, Mary Crotty, using a treasured wedding ring that once held the promise of her own future unrealized. When Neat was 22, she fell in love. He was a gentleman in every sense of the word. And I like gentlemen. Her gentleman was 24-year-old Arthur Stanfield from Bonavista, a school teacher just like her. He was a handsome young man, and I thought that I had the world in a shell. But we have to take life as it comes. And life did step in. World War II, Arthur enlisted in the Navy. But before he went off to war, they made a promise to each other. He came to the house to see me where I was staying. And uh, he said, uh, will you marry me? And I said, when you come back. And he said, uh, will you accept a ring? And I said, yes. So he knelt down and put the ring on my finger. It's still with me. Arthur survived the war, but he died on his way back home to Newfoundland. He visited his family in Toronto and he was on his way to Newfoundland and I was waiting, anticipating. He went out to Niagara Falls and there was a boat capsized. He swam out and he got two people, saved their lives, came back to shore, brought them back, and uh, he died of a heart attack. I picked up the paper and I read the notice in the paper and that's how I found out. I didn't shed any tears. But I closed the paper and I put it down on the, and I went to my room. And I prayed. That's the only thing I could do. And I felt very much alone at that time, although there was many people around. But I really felt like I was absolutely alone. No one to turn to. So she turned to the future, her dream of going overseas as a missionary. And I thought that we would go together. So I did say to God, I will go alone and do what I can. 
I went to India, and I was there for 30 years. Neat became Major Vardy with the Salvation Army, a nurse in charge of the Children's Hospital Ward in what was once called Bombay. That's also where Mother Teresa had an orphanage. I would send a child to her, but sometimes they got sick and they, she would send them to, back to us to the hospital. Then one day, a sick, orphaned infant, a little girl named Leela, captured Neat's heart. She was just a bundle of bones and not very pretty to look at. But if you look into anybody, there's some beauty there. So I saw the beautiful spot and I adopted her. And I brought her up. She went to college. She got married. She, had th she has three handsome young men now. They have all been through university. Generation after generation, and throughout it all, Neat kept her engagement ring close, wearing it on a necklace every day, an act of devotion that never wavered. She continued to love Arthur and only Arthur. Still, just as fresh today as the day he asked me, to marry him. I have never seen anybody that I've been interested in. Lots and lots of male friends. But right at the very beginning, I would make it quite clear that I wasn't interested. Not the least bit interested in getting married. Or anything else. <laughs> Arthur was truly the love of her life. And he asked me to wait for him. I'm still waiting. If you make a promise, you keep it. The promise is made. Now, a new promise, a second chance for her cherished ring. And I wanted somebody to have them that would care. You got a wonderful man there. I do. I do. So that's that story. And what a story it is. I can't believe that she's 99 years old. I can only hope that when I reach that age that I'm as bright and as sharp as she is. I know, absolutely. And you know what? She turns 100 in January. Wow. Just amazing. And you know, I also spoke with the bride who now wears Neat's rings. Here's what Mary Crotty has to say about receiving such a meaningful gift. When she first told me about the rings and offered me the rings, I was, uh, I was speechless because I thought, who am I? that she would hold these rings all these years and, and, and want to give them to me. And uh, so when I picked them up and I saw how beautiful her ring was and, and her engagement ring, I was, I was just overwhelmed. Uh, we, we will cherish them because of who owned them and the history that surrounds them. She just, she only had Arthur. He was it. And even though he was loved and lost, he is still with her very much. Well, in other news tonight, an 18-year-old reported missing yesterday has been found in good health today. But the story doesn't end there. Nathan Brown's parents say he went missing because of how he was treated by a security guard at the Health Sciences Center parking lot. Here now is Mark Quinn explains. Jason Brown has dealt with a mix of powerful emotions over the last 24 hours. When his son Nathan Brown went missing, there was fear and disbelief. Today, there was joy. Oh, it was great. I shook, I cried, I hugged them. It, it, it's shocking that this happened. 18-year-old Brown disappeared yesterday. This morning, a helicopter and a police drone searched the wooded area behind the Health Sciences Center. Before noon, Brown was found walking on Freshwater Road. He had spent the night outdoors. When it rained real hard and it got real cold, we found a couple places to duck in. He said he don't really know where. He said once it was between two rocks by a car. His father calls it shocking because of what happened here in this parking lot while Nathan's family was inside the hospital. My son went to... Uh, go out and sit in the car and he apparently he went to the wrong car and 
tried to get into Ron Carr in the security, came and asked him if he wanted an x-ray, and he didn't say nothing, and they escorted him off the property. Brown says his son was badly mistreated here. He says Nathan has health problems, gets confused and doesn't speak, didn't know his address or phone number. He believes security people at Eastern Health should have done more to help his son. I think they should have brought him inside. Brought him inside and, and reviewed the cameras and seen who he came with and tried to find a little more information out instead of driving, driving a sick kid off the property. In a statement, Eastern Health says it's investigating what happened and Brown says the health authority has asked him to meet with them. It's probably not going to be that nice right at the beginning. But Brown wants to meet with Eastern Health because he hopes what happened to his son will never happen again, especially at a health care facility. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, what's the security company saying? Well, we asked Paladin Security and they said they're not going to comment while Eastern Health is investigating. There's a teenager missing tonight on the Northern Peninsula. The RCMP is hoping someone can help them find 16-year-old Braden Burden. Burden is from St. Lunaire Gricket and was last seen hitchhiking in the St. Anthony area around 9 o'clock last night. He's 6 feet tall, 205 pounds and has short brown hair with brown eyes. He was last seen wearing a black hoodie, blue jeans and black and gold running shoes. Well, we're expecting to find out tonight exactly when an inquiry will start into the Muskrat Falls project. Sources tell Here and Now the Premier will use his speech at a Liberal fundraising dinner to outline the timeline. Dwight Ball has said he wants an inquiry but has resisted calls to start it now. That's been the demand from both supporters and opponents of the project. The Premier argued it would distract Nalcor from its job of finishing the project as quickly and cheaply as possible. Earlier this month, the Premier said officials were working on terms of reference. The speech tonight will be in front of 500 Liberal Party supporters who are all paying $500 a plate. Tonight on CBC Investigates, another health sciences program at the College of the North Atlantic is under the microscope. This past summer, the respiratory therapy program was suspended after concerns about the emotional safety of students and high attrition rates. Now, documents from a different accreditation group highlight issues with the college's medical radiography program. Here now is Jen White has that story. The Canadian Medical Association wrote this report in June after a visit to the college this spring. It outlined several concerns with the medical radiography program, questions about student safety when using x-ray equipment and being left unattended in labs. Radiation equipment is fully energized during scheduled lab sessions. Radiation production is possible. Students are responsible for equipment warm-up, a practice that involves radiation exposures. Students said they were often unsupervised in both scenarios, and many students reported having to learn mostly on their own. They asked the college to meet some critical criteria by the end of next month. Now, because of those problems, the three-year program is currently only accredited for two. What's not clear is how it will affect students. The report says the college has to bring in more safety measures, like completing its safety manual and hiring a certified radiation safety officer. The college declined our interview requests, but issued a statement saying it is working with the Canadian Medical Association and has an ongoing commitment to quality assurance. The college says it will provide more details when the review process is complete. Back to the desk. Oh, thanks, Jen. That's here now is Jen White reporting. And uh, Ryan, it was certainly a mozzy old day out there with all that drizzle that we had throughout the morning and afternoon. Yeah, on the one hand, it felt nice and warm. You were like, yeah, I could get outside, but the dampness yeah. really took away from that. And it's still a very mild evening, but uh, the drizzle has really ramped up, of course, so later this afternoon. And currently, we're seeing those uh, periods of rain, at times heavy. You can see with the radar, some of those yellows and oranges, those are some of the steadier periods of rain that have been moving across the Avalon, the Buren Peninsula in particular. Some scattered showers even up towards the central and western parts of Newfoundland, but the bulk of the moisture here tonight will be right across the Buren and the Avalon Peninsula's rainfall warnings continue for the Buren and the southern Avalon. Special weather statements for the northern Avalon. And again, this line of rain will start to wander eastward through the overnight, but still clipping the Avalon in particular uh, through the overnight. Still some lingering rain into tomorrow morning, in fact, as 
well. Some scattered showers and drizzle on the menu for west into central parts of Newfoundland. And to start the day tomorrow, we're talking about wet flurries in the mix across most of Labrador, especially Lab West, where we're going to be dropping down to minus one by tomorrow morning. So your early morning outlook calls for, yeah, umbrellas and raincoats once again in St. John's. Watch for a chance of a shower towards western Newfoundland. It's a dry start in central and along that south coast. And again, those flurry chances in Labrador. We'll talk about what uh, the weekend holds and, of course, your full Friday forecast in just a few minutes. Peter. Terry Fox's older brother Fred is in St. John's to talk about the foundation. But what does that have to do with basketball? I'm Jeremy Eaton, I'll tell you why. Coming up, I'm here and now. Uh, not gonna live that one down. Well, outgoing MP Judy Foote makes her goodbye speech in the House of Commons. We'll find out what she had to say in just a few moments. Welcome back to Here and Now. When you think of Terry Fox, you likely don't think about basketball. No, most likely you think about his marathon of hope, his dream to put an end to cancer. Yeah, but Terry Fox played basketball at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, and that's when he lost his leg to cancer. And tonight, there's a charity basketball game at Memorial University featuring Terry's brother, Fred Fox, and our very own Jeremy Eaton. So, Jeremy, is Fred Fox just here to take you up on a game of hoop? No, he certainly is not. Now, this is a charity event to raise a little bit of extra money for the Terry Fox Foundation. 
basketball superstars like myself, as well as uh, Minister Andrew Parsons, Jamie Korab, and Fred Fox will take part in this game here at the Memorial University Physical Education Gym. Now, the Terry Fox story, well, that's really well known. But earlier this afternoon, students at Bishop Field in St. John's got to hear about a man that they learn about in school from his older brother, Fred. Now, here's a little bit of his presentation and our conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. You did a great job. Thank you. One of the weeks in the year that uh, all the schools, uh, not only here in Newfoundland, but uh, across Canada, that uh, are participating in their Terry's Fox runs and walks across the country. So it's an amazing week. I get to speak to schools that are participating, uh, schools and, and teachers and, and parents that uh, have uh, dedicated their time and, uh, of course, monies to keep Terry's dream alive. And it, it's such a, an important message to uh, students as well to learn about Terry. But I've been running because I want to run across Canada to raise money for cancer research so no one else will have to suffer the cause of cancer in the future. Our mom got upset, very protective. She said, why the heck would you want to run across Canada? What a crazy idea. Why don't you just run from the Alberta BC border, uh, finish in Stanley Park in Vancouver, you can raise money that way. And Terry would say, mom, not only people in BC get cancer, but people right across Canada do, I have to start in St. John's. I mean, this is where it started. Um, you know, Terry wrote in his journal, this is the day it all begins. And uh, started here in St. John's and dipping his artificial foot in the harbor in the Atlantic Ocean. And, and it does. And Terry often talked about, after he was forced to come back home, uh, after Thunder Bay, he often reflected back about the, how people treated him here in this province, uh, brought them in, him and Doug, into their homes and fed them and offered them a comfortable bed. And he loved this province. It was tough. Uh, it was hard to get through, I mean, the hills and the wind and the cold weather when he started, but Terry would often say it, it's not supposed to be easy. So he was, he was up for any challenge, and uh, Newfoundland sure, certainly challenged him, but it's where it all began. <laughs> The kids weren't born 37 years ago, either they're, likely their parents weren't either. So um, it's an amazing thing um, to be able to share a little bit more about Terry. But more, it's, it, for me, it's about Terry did have a family. It was just not, about, not somebody they, they read about in a book or watch a video or go for a walk you know, and to raise money every year for he He was an average, ordinary kid, just like them. Um, he had to work a little bit harder than most kids, maybe, and we're only a year apart, Terry and I, and hopefully I can share and make that connection a little bit, that he did have a family, brothers and sisters, and, and um, he, he was just like them. If, if I don't make it, it's going to be something that uh, nobody would make it. Anything is possible if you try. The dreams are made when you try. Terry was an average, ordinary kid who had to work harder than anybody else to accomplish the goals and, and see some of those dreams that he had come true. I'm going to finish my presentation by quoting our mom. And mom would say at the end of her speeches, she would say, just like Terry, always set goals and never, ever give up on your dreams. Thank you so much for having me here today at Bishop Field. Thank you. Fox says that his brother Terry's uh, message is more important now than ever before. While the Marathon of Hope has raised hundreds of millions of dollars and has done a lot of good work, Fox says there still is no cure for cancer. Now I'm going to have to step in with my team here and work on my jump shot. As you saw earlier, I couldn't hit one, so i got to get a little bit better. And we'll be back uh, later on in the show to talk a little bit more about what Fred Fox is doing in St. John's. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. Uh, mixed emotions. Uh, I've worn that chain for 21 years. But Claude Elliott's decades as mayor comes to an end. We're with him as he passes off the chain of office.
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Welcome back to Here Now. Ryan's here with a look at the weather forecast. All right, I am not liking the sound of all of this rain. It's really not good dog walking <laughs> weather, and I have a brand Terrible. new puppy that is not house trained, and I have to bring her out every time. So, how long am I going to have to? deal <laughs> how many times a night do you have to pop out oh, several several yeah. times so right now it's either the house gets <laughs> wet or hours. carolyn gets wet <laughs> yeah. those are the two options that's right yeah raincoat umbrella <laughs> whatever you need to do uh you're gonna have to definitely cover up as we uh, roll through tonight that rain is not going to let up across the avalon uh right through the overnight uh, even for those of us that don't have to take the dog out, the dogs come back in. They're all wet, yeah. mucky. That's what we're dealing with uh, tonight in the east is that those periods of rain uh, do continue right through tonight. Now, the rain will depart through tomorrow morning. Some lingering showers and drizzle for most of the island tomorrow. Lingering flurries in Labrador. Some bright news, though, and a little bit of sun. Not only on the menu for tomorrow, at least in the mix, uh, certainly a pretty solid-looking Saturday and even parts of Sunday looking like we'll have a little taste of sunshine as well. We'll talk more about that coming up in your long range forecast. Let's have a look at uh, where we still have those rainfall warnings in effect. Southern Avalon across to the Buren Peninsula, upwards of 80 millimeters to upwards of even locally, not ruling out a 100 millimeter bullseye here across the Southern Avalon. Special weather statements uh, continue for the Northern Avalon as well for the metro region and across to Conception Bay North. There is the uh, latest Canadian model projection. You can see that area is shaded in white. That is where the model is indicating the potential of 100 plus millimeters. That's not out of the question anywhere in this area actually in red, which is the uh, uh, 50 plus bullseye and you can see over across the southern Buren Peninsula as well where you we do have that potential to see over 50 millimeters there hence the rainfall warning in effect so it's very wet especially along the south coast but everybody here across the Avalon Clareville Bonavista just on the outside looking in certainly a couple of showers on the menu through tonight and in same thing for central parts of Newfoundland but the bulk of this rain is headed straight up for the Avalon now that said this front is slowly wandering eastward and so that's some good news because boy if this front stalled out, there is a ton of moisture, some now feeding up from Maria and just tropical in origin. If this was parked overhead, we would be talking about a bad situation. But uh, thankfully, that front is wandering eastward. Much of that rain tonight and in through Friday actually starts to move offshore. And certainly through the day on Friday, that front continues to rain itself out, but it's for the fish. By the time we get to Friday afternoon, uh, certainly that northerly wind is going to be the dominant feature across the island with some lingering showers and drizzle chances and as we roll into the big land we are talking about uh, some flurry chances lingering into Friday but we're improving for Saturday. Here's how things will shape up for tomorrow morning then. Wet start 15 degrees mild start but winds won't be southwesterly for, lo for long they will shift to northwest through the morning as that front moves offshore. Uh, so we're starting cooler with winds light to northwesterly across uh, central and western parts of the Newfoundland. Uh, Cornerbrook, Northern Peninsula into southeastern Labrador, the best chance of seeing some precip early on. Uh, not ruling out some wet flurries on the go for southern parts of Labrador and up towards the north coast as well. Note the temperature early on, 15. We're drying out but cooling down as that northwest wind comes in. We're going to be dropping the temp to around 13, even 12 degrees by home time, 8 degrees tomorrow evening. I think we're dry for tomorrow afternoon across the Avalon, but a lingering chance of drizzle will move back in for tomorrow evening. So keep that in mind if you do have some Friday evening plans. Uh, so temps falling on the Avalon and back closer to the, this, these types of numbers that we'll see most of the day in central Newfoundland at 10, 11, 12 degrees up towards the west coast as well. I think we'll be dry for the most part along the south coast tomorrow. Chance of a patchy shower or, or a drizzle, uh, 15 to uh, 13 to 15 degrees. And look at those highs in Labrador, especially in the west, low single digits at just three, four, five degrees along the north coast. And we'll talk about your weekend forecast in just a few minutes, Peter. Well, there's a big change coming to politics in the town of Gander after more than two decades in the top job. Claude Elliott is no longer mayor. Here now's Garrett Barry sat down with him on his final day in office. His last act, his last day, handing off the chain of office. Claude Elliott decided to retire from municipal politics. If I only had 10 years in, yeah, I might consider it, but with 27, no, I think it's time to uh, sit back and relax and, and enjoy life and pass the torch to somebody else. 
Councillor since 90, mayor since 96. He's seen lots, even dined with Fidel Castro. It's all been worth it. No, I wouldn't change what I've been through for the last uh, 21 years as mayor. You know, yeah, I, I, I've had days that you question your sanity, but uh, for most part, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't change it because for that day is out, something good is going to happen, and then you're going to say, "Now that's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing it." He says Gander is stronger than it was. It's even being celebrated on Broadway in Come From Away. Elliot says the days after 9/11 are his biggest memory. Uh, little did we know that day uh, what role Gander and surrounding communities was going to play. What we see to be so simple in life is extraordinary to the rest of the world. Uh, and would you, I would have never thought that you could make a musical out of sandwiches and, and a bowl of soup and, and a blanket. His hardest decision, all those years ago, should he or shouldn't he take the plunge for the mayor's job? Looking back on all the memories, it's an emotional day. I think when I walk out of here now in a little while, that uh, knowing that I'm not coming back here anymore or don't have to come back here anymore, it's, uh, you know, you're walking away from part of your life, uh, 27 years of your life, and uh, part, of your, part of your family is left behind, and uh, you know, but... Uh, you know, i got to move on. So Mayor Elliott is saying his farewells, moving on. A new era is beginning, one with more time for family, friends, and moose hunting. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Gander. Well, speaking of this week's municipal elections, remember the Trout River story we told you about? Ten of the candidates there had uh, the last name Crocker. Five were named Break, and there were three with the last name White. Well, here's a look at the results of who was elected Tuesday night, and it looks like the Crockers are the big winners. Five of the seven people voted into office are Crockers. We have Marsha, Rosie, Tina, Elwood, and Horace. And the others elected are Gloria Barnes and Tom Shepard. Now, we contacted the town office in Trout River to see whether any of those or all of them are uh, related, all of those Crockers, and uh, we're waiting on a reply. That's Newfoundland politics for you. <laughs> and speaking of Newfoundland politicians, Judy Foote, the Member of Parliament for Bonavista Buren Trinity, well, she gave her final farewell address in the House of Commons today. And here's a little bit of what she had to say. The outpouring of support for and appreciation of that decision has been overwhelming. No one has been more understanding and supportive than my seatmate and friend, the Prime Minister. He continually reminds his caucus to put our families first. The memories I have of the strength and courage of another young man who dipped his leg in the Atlantic Ocean in Newfoundland and Labrador before starting his marathon of hope will always stay with me. I was a reporter with CBC at the time and assigned to cover the story. Terry and I talked about his bout with cancer and his vision of using his experience to bring a focus to the need for research. As the interview ended, I commented on his curly hair. He had a lot of it. He told me it was a positive outcome for him, having lost his hair while being given chemotherapy drugs to battle the cancer. As anyone who has fought cancer will tell you, remaining positive is half the battle. Little did I know that several years later, I would be diagnosed with breast cancer. Not once, but twice. Most recently, three years ago. Like Terry, I lost my hair, and while it may not look like it now, it grew back curly. <laughs> As it grew back, I thought of Terry and his curls, but especially his positive attitude. And being aware of that became even more important when it was discovered two years ago that I carry the BRAC gene. Having the BRAC gene means your body is susceptible to any number of cancers. It also means those, clo those closest to you are at risk. Getting my head around what having the gene could mean for my children, Carla, Jason, and Heidi, and their children, if they inherited it from me, was difficult. And needless to say, remains so, because unfortunately, two of my three children did. Mr. Speaker, I have said to anyone who will listen, I am blessed with an amazing family. 
As they watch today from the gallery and at home, I thank them for their tremendous support during the entire 28 years I have been in political life, support that never wavered. They knew how much I appreciated the opportunity I had been given and that I thrived on it. Having served in provincial politics prior to being elected in 2008 as a member of parliament, we knew as a family the job would take me away from home more often than I would be at home. And as an MP representing a riding of 240 communities, even when I was in Newfoundland and Labrador, it meant I was rarely home. My husband of 43 years, Howard has put up with Howard has put up with such a crazy lifestyle. And knowing how much I enjoyed my job, campaigned vigorously every election to help me keep it. In fact, I always said, we ran. He has been the stalwart in our family, a husband, a dad, a father-in-law, and now a poppy to Katie May, <coughs> Meadow, Ruby Jude, and Elliot to whom we say we love you to the moon and back. Judy Foote isn't the only person thinking of Terry Fox today. Terry Fox's brother spent part of today meeting young students. Tonight, he's heading to Munn to play basketball. We'll tell you why, coming up. Well, let's head back to Memorial University where there's a lot of basketball happening tonight. Yeah, it all has to do with the Terry Fox Foundation. We've got Jeremy Eaton live. And Jeremy, I sure hope you found some players that are a little bit better than you if you want to have a <laughs> shot of winning tonight. <laughs> Burn. Uh, Peter, I'm wearing, my, I'm wearing my sports headband. So I'm, I'm here to, I'm taking this very, very seriously. And somebody who's also taking it very seriously is Heather Strong. Now she is, uh, she runs the Terry Fox Foundation here in Newfoundland and Labrador. 
Heather, people are wondering, why is Fred Fox playing in a charity basketball game? You know what? Why hasn't he done it all, all these years uh, before now? Uh, Terry was a basketball athlete, a varsity athlete at Simon Fraser. And, uh, and it was actually his, his basketball buddies that helped fundraise initially to get him to St. John's to start the Marathon of Hope and cover some of those expenses. So this is just a perfect fit and we're really excited about it. And this is the first time that, Heather was telling me just earlier, this is the first time that this game has been done. But it's not the first day that Fred's been in town. He's been in town for a while. What's he been up to since he came here? Where has he been? Yeah, well, I, I keep joking that he's going to leave here with a Newfoundland accent. He came on uh, Saturday, and we uh, had him down at the Buren Peninsula and visiting schools and communities um, all throughout the south uh, south coast and now he's spending the next couple of days here in the metro area thanking people um, usually what we say is you know it's hard to know over here in newfoundland whether your your money matters whether your participation counts and so when a member of the fox family uh, visits we like to think that that's proof that we we do matter over here our donations do count and it's an opportunity for him to share that Heather, uh, you're a well-known curler from this province, so I gotta ask. Depends uh, are, on the day. <laughs> are you a good basketball player? We're about to find <laughs> out. I'm worried about the height difference, and I'm jealous of the hair bands, So we'll see. Now, I, we're just sort of wondering, who did you uh, line up here for this charity basketball? Who did you guys bring out here tonight? Some of the notables. Well, we've got Andrew Parsons here. We've got uh, media personalities like yourself. We've got some cancer researchers actually from uh, some funded labs here on campus. And uh, we've got some varsity athletes and that's really powerful with Terry as a varsity athlete. These are the kids the same age that Terry was and, uh, and so we're really excited to, uh, to beat you in a minute. <laughs> as you can tell, Heather, are on a, Heather and I are on opposing teams. So we're gonna we're gonna get on the court now. The game's about to get underway. So we're gonna find out who is better, the white team or the not white team. And I'm hoping that it's gonna be me. So thanks for joining us, Heather. Thanks for coming out. Reporting live uh, for here and now in St. John's. I'm Jeremy Eaton with my snazzy headband. Well, how's this for horsing around? Oral Jessica shared this video of his horse, Oliver. Yes, Oliver lives at Westgate Park Stables in the Goulds and loves playing with his rope. His owner says he's always up to something. I wonder if you can actually do that with a <laughs> skipping rope. You yeah, know, you can get do some, some jump rope. Exactly. Some tricks going on. Get the kids in there. Lots of fun. <laughs>
athlete of the day, this is Georgia Windsor of, where else? Grand Falls, Windsor. <laughs> Georgia is seven years old and she's been involved with the Leslie Oak School of Dance for four years. She loves jazz and ballet dancing. Georgia also loves swimming and playing outside with friends. Congratulations, Georgia. You are today's young athlete of the day. Well, we've all heard of the New York Minute, but how about a St. John's Summer Minute? Yeah, yes. sometimes it seems like it only lasts that long, but yeah. Ryan, you've put together a time lapse of our summer all condensed down into one minute. That's right. Uh, I've obviously had some help with this. So one minute. Uh, have a look. This is what the summer looks like, and uh, now we have a couple of things we want to point out. Uh, okay. Let's roll it. Uh, this is the view, by the way, from our camera atop the CBC building look across, looking across the parkway. We'll notice the spider who makes an appearance actually frequently when oh, we pause this here. There he is. Uh, <laughs> He's attacking the education building. <laughs> he actually gets bigger as the summer goes on. So really? he, was, he was in a good spot. He uh, was feeding well. well fed. You can see him uh, appearing there. Couple of notable things here. Obviously the construction that gets underway at Munn. You can yeah. see uh, the big cranes that are that are built. Many more sunny days than cloudy days and Absolutely. rainy days. Yeah, that, that was uh, one of the nice things about the summer. Yeah. Also oh, noting here, uh, as uh, Rod pointed out, our, our switcher director, a lot of people park in the same spots every day. They'll yeah, we'll have it there at CBC. <laughs> and we can keep track of what, what time did you get to work, Ryan? Yeah. We, can, we, should, we need a time stamp I was late here to keep an a eye lot, on you. So hopefully they weren't denoting that. It, Right uh, around here, you can see where it really turns wet. That was our big wet weekend in St. John's uh, in early September. But then the sun came back. And the sun came back, and uh, now, yeah, summer is over. And it's cool to see the construction and all the cranes spinning around there. Definitely, with the Mon Science Building, of course, being built across the road. Now, last night at this time, you know, Cowan, you were grumbling about the forecast, and not just. I'm not. The, I'm not the only one, Ryan. Grumbling. I I can't have been the only one. No, but. It is uh, important to remember that we're late September and we're actually talking about temperatures near the seasonal mark. We should only yeah. really be around 13, 14 degrees this time of year on the island. Yeah, but after such a great summer, it's like you just wanted to keep going right into a great fall and then a great winter. I... It's got to end sometime. I, I know. I like these temperatures. Yeah, and when you talk about uh, the warm temps today, unfortunately it has come at a price, which is the rainfall. And that's what tends to happen as we move into the fall, is we get into some of these nice warm pushes of air. They come with a price tag that is rain, and that's what we've got right now. Rainfall warnings are in effect for the Southern Avalon and the Buren Peninsula. Again, by the time we wrap up tomorrow morning, upwards of 80, even 100 millimeters, not out of the question locally. Uh, in some spots along the Southern Avalon and the Southern Buren in particular. Special weather statements still in effect for the St. John's Metro region against this long line of tropical moisture funneling up through this cold front. Some of that moisture now courtesy of Tropical Storm Maria. The good news for us is this front is wandering eastward. It's not stalled. And so while the rain will certainly be heavy tonight and into early Friday morning, that front will move offshore, saving us from a, a full out uh, flooding situation. By the time we get to Friday evening, you can see where the northerly winds and behind this system are going to certainly keep temperatures cool tomorrow, a little cooler than seasonal. In fact, shower chances are best found tomorrow along the west coast, northern peninsula. Uh, chance of certainly some afternoon showers darting into central Newfoundland. I think St. John's and the Avalon, after that rain clears, it's a pretty good afternoon. And then some evening chances of uh, showers move back in. Across Labrador, it's a mainly cloudy day, certainly a, uh, an isolated shower or wet flurry tomorrow morning. Uh, that uh, flurry chance will uh, start to uh, dissipate as temperatures rise to 5 and 7 degrees in the southeast tomorrow. Now for Saturday, note those lingering clouds and even a a spotty shower, let's call it that, uh, even a drizzle chance along the northeast coast, coast including St. John's for Saturday, primarily in, more, in the morning, but not ruling it out into the afternoon as well. Temperatures, thanks to those northerly winds, are going to be only 8 to 9 degrees, 10 through central, a little bit warmer towards the southwest coast, and possibly even some double digits in Happy Valley. Goose Bay, increasing clouds, late day showers will mix to some evening and overnight flurries as the temperatures really drop in Labrador City as this front comes through. Now, still some disagreement with the timing of this front, but it does appear it'll arrive in western parts of Newfoundland and the Northern Peninsula for Sunday afternoon. Looks like a late day risk for Central. I think we're staying dry on Sunday in eastern Newfoundland. And with that wind shift, 
temperatures are certainly more favorable. We're talking back closer to seasonal, Mr. Peter Cowan, 13, 14 degrees just for you. And as we are uh, looking into Labrador, we're talking about high single digits with those shower chances fading away and even some sun breaking through possibly for Happy Valley Goose Bay and Labrador City into the afternoon. A quick look at the seven day shows Monday, Tuesday looking pretty good. We'll bring some shower chances back in for Wednesday into Thursday, though a lot of uncertainty with that midweek system. Labrador, you can see uh, watching for uh, a pretty good Monday and temps rising into next week, but with rain coming too. Thank you very much, Ryan. Stephen Norris, it's a name that you may not know, but Atlantic Light Theatre is trying to change that. Norris was one of the soldiers in the Newfoundland Regiment during World War I, and he's the focus of the original musical A Call to Arms that hits the stage at Holy Heart Theatre in St. John's tomorrow night. He's a sentimental regimental sergeant major who fiercely trains us how to fight. Whether calling us to quarters or just shouting out his orders, he keeps telling us we never do it right. This play is the story of Stephen Norris from Three Arms Island in Notre Dame Bay. A very determined young man, as were many young Newfoundlanders back in the uh, early days of this, of this past century, and he's determined to join the Newfoundland Regiment and go fight for his country. Originally, this play was done 12 years ago at Gonzaga High School under uh, Jacinta Graham and uh, written by Petrina Bromley and her uh, in conjunction with the theater arts class at Gonzaga at the time. And after they did the second year of this in 2005, things really started to unfold. I keep describing it as an onion where layer after layer after layer come to light. And the amount of inf information that has come to light in the past 12 years is just astounding. What sort of things are you talking about, things coming to light? Well, in the first uh, rendition of this musical, they created a love interest. Since this musical finished in 2005, they found out that there really was a love interest. And her name was Hannah Aylward. She was a teacher who taught in Conch and met Stephen Norris in Conch. They developed a relationship. Of course, Stephen went off to war and was killed. Hannah eventually moved to Grand Falls, where she married an Aylward and died in the early, 19, uh, early 1990s, I believe. When the flash and blast of battle came too near And a soldier in the trenches froze with fear He would tell the raw recruit You better take your gun and shoot or you will get my hobnail boot right in your rear He would tell the raw recruit You better take your gun and shoot or you will get my hobnail boot right in your rear In his ear? <laughs> no, his rear. Oh dear. <laughs> have her on board with this project has been absolutely amazing. She's spent so much time working on the script, rewriting, revamping, everything. It's just been phenomenal working with her. Met a lassie with a pretty little pout. When I started to engage her, all I did was just enrage her and the bloody sergeant major knocked me out. We Newfoundlanders like to tell stories, and telling stories is something that we're very good at. We do it in poetry, in prose, in recitations, in song, and so on. And every bit of our history that we can put together uh, makes, us, makes our story more complete. And so this is just one of the stories from the First World War that completes a little bit more our overall picture of Newfoundland and Labrador. And so it's important for all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to know this story and to celebrate it. Yeah, Call to Arms was originally set to run uh, just tomorrow and then Saturday, but there's been a lot of buzz about the production, so they've actually added a third show for Sunday. Yes, and showtime is 8 p.m. Tickets are available through the Holy Heart box office. And you are looking at our beautiful viewer picture of the day. Where was this taken? Well, Western Newfoundland, that's your clue for today. And uh, note the topography, a little low lying there. We'll uh, have the details after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The Chicago Cubs and St. Louis Cardinals may be fierce rivals on the field, but a good deed provided a little bit of respite from any sort of sports hostilities. Well, this is Cubs shortstop Addison Russell. And you, oh yeah, you can see there he knocks a plate of nachos after diving in after the ball. But a little bit of a good deed. He went and replaced those nachos. The fan <laughs> got the meal and a selfie and a great story. <laughs> Great. Well, how's this for a special visitor? What's your favorite team? Uh, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> the Stanley Cup stopped by a senior's home in O'Leary, Prince Edward Island this week during the community's Hockeyville festivities. And as you might expect, the trophy was a big hit. And Ryan, I wonder if there were any Leafs fans among that crowd. I would think so. Lots of Leafs fans on the PEI, as there are here in Newfoundland. They just have to look really, really hard to find out where the Leafs oh. might actually be on that stand. Yeah, they're there. They're there. <laughs> way, way back. Yeah. In the olden days. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, viewer picture of the day. This is a place called the Gravels, and it's on the Port-a-Port -Port Peninsula. Port-a-Port -Port itself, in fact, it's uh, close to the community of Port-a-Port. -Port. And a beautiful picture there from Darlene and Rob Webb. And uh, yeah, great stuff there. So many pictures on my Facebook page. Thanks so much to everybody that's been posting and keep them coming. I love it. Gorgeous. If only we could have some of that sunshine. That'd be great. Yeah. That's it for us. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a good night. <laughs> you too. Good night.